Slade Ciccone gives up three home runs in one inning as the D-backs lose to the Dodgers in game one, six to four. But hey, at least Quetzal Marte extended his hitting streak. You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? Always here as a matter host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. I'm there. You can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at careerthomas24 for the personal account. Look up Locked on Dimebacks, both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And please follow my personal Instagram, miller.thomas123, because I'm always at a D-back scheme. So if you want to follow me along, please do it there on Instagram. Now, on today's show, we'll talk about the D-backs losing in disappointing fashion to the Dodgers in Game 1. We'll dive into Keto Marte's hitting streak. And then we'll preview game two, Brendan Fott versus Gavin Stone and why the D-backs obviously need Fott to shove in his start tomorrow. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. One of those platforms is YouTube, so please hit subscribe to Locked On Dimebacks on YouTube. Our goal is to hit 2,000 subs by the All-Star break, so once again, please hit subscribe to Locked On Diamondbacks on YouTube. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepickscom slash MLB and use code all lowercase Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Now let's get into the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Let's talk about that game one to the LA Dodgers because the D-backs lose game one, six to four, and it was another frustrating game where the starting pitching wasn't the best, the lack of offense wasn't the best, the bullpen did come through for the D-backs in this game, but once again, the D-backs struggle. And I guess you could actually say their starting pitching in this game was good. It was the bullpen that was actually terrible because – D-backs went with the opener approach. As I said, I'm not a big fan of the opener approach, but it did work out in this scenario. Joe Mantiply started the game for the D-backs. Seven pitches, six strikes, worked through the inning pretty quickly. Then Slade Ciccone came in. All the numbers show you he's really good that first time, first two innings of a game. Slade Ciccone is elite. But that second, third time through, that's where he struggles, and it reared his ugly head in this one we actually didn't even get a chance to get to the second time through the lineup because in the third inning Slade Ciccone the wheels fell off for Slade who has been struggling a lot recently Slade is someone I love the way he started the season I thought he was really good at the beginning of the year the first few starts I thought Slade could have been a little hidden gem for the D-backs as that spot starter holding it down while some dudes are hurt. But as it's currently trending, it looks like Slade needs to get some more work down in the minors because he was flat out bad uh, for the D-backs. And really, he wasn't bad the whole game. He was really just bad in the third inning because in that third inning, Slade Ciccone gave up three home runs. He started off with a home run to Kike Hernandez. He then got the bases loaded on, I will say, he threw a strike on ball five that walked the bases loaded to Shohei Otani. He threw a strike, and the umpire called the ball. I'm not saying Otani gets out in that at bat. I'm not saying Freddie Freeman still doesn't hit a home run next at bat. But I'm just saying, if you're going to go against the L.A. Dodgers and these awesome superstars and the Shohei Otani's, like, when we throw him strikes on the plate, We need to get those called strikes. You can't have D-backs pitchers throwing strike against the Otanis of the world with Freddie Freeman coming up with bases loaded and you're calling it a ball. You can't help out the Dodgers with the margins like that. And so very frustrating to see, but 
still leads to a big inning for the LA Dodgers. I don't think that strike would have changed the inning. I think the Dodgers still have a big inning regardless. But afterwards, Freddie Freeman hits a grand slam. And then, of course, D-backs killer Will Smith follows it up with a home run. And right now, I think Slade Ciccone just needs to go back to the minor leagues and get some more work done because he has not been good recently on the major league level. And what's so crazy, if you actually look at uh, the the innings after the one two or the innings after the three home run inning, the fourth inning one two three for Slade, the fifth inning one two three for Slade, the sixth inning one two three for Slade. That's why I'm not like it wasn't it, it wasn't the worst start in the world. Yes, he gave up six earned runs in one inning, but he was pretty dominant after that. But even with that being said, even though I feel like the 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 start in his entirety wasn't horrendous. He still gave up three home runs and six earned runs in one inning. And in three of his last four starts, Slade Ciccone has given up at least six earned runs. So over his last four starts, he's given up uh, six earned runs, six earned runs. Then he had a decent start. And then he gave up six earned runs tonight to the LA Dodgers. Slade, I think, needs to go down and just, you know, work on some stuff in the minor leagues. Why not give? another youngster a chance Bryce Jarvis he was good tonight we know he's been shaky all season long for the D-backs out the bullpen why not just send Slade down to the minor leagues and give Bryce Jarvis a shot might as well see what he can do can't be really any worse than what we've seen from the Slades and the Ryan Nelsons this year I would also not mind giving Blake Walston a shot who has been having a pretty good season in the minor leagues right now 369 ERA 31.2 31.2 innings pitch, 13 earned runs, 31 strikeouts. He is, what, top 15 prospect in the D-backs organization. We've already seen him w- once this season, and it came against the L.A. Dodgers. I wouldn't mind giving Walston another shot, at least in the rotation, just to see what he could do. I, I just want to see how a Blake Walston pitches on the Major League level. He's in his mid-20s. I think if you're going to call him up and give him that opportunity, I think now's a good time to do it. You're struggling with the Slades, the Ryans. You have a lot of people still hurt in your rotation. There's really not a good reason not to give Blake Walston an opportunity. And another guy that you could potentially look at, who I actually think is ready and would be a good option, is a Christian Mena. Now, the only thing with Mena, I don't know if they feel like they want to call him up this early because I do think he's the best D-backs pitching prospect in AAA right now. But he's only 21 years old. I feel like when the D-backs call him up, they want him to be potentially the everyday number five starter or be just an everyday member in the rotation. Right now for Mena, it would just be a spot starter until the other members in the rotation returns. But the D-backs right now, a few games below 500. They are not good. They are hanging on by a thread, and it's only because that NL wild card race is so wide open. Mena is your best pitching prospect, and he can help out the D-backs right now and keep them in the race. Then that has to be a move that the D-backs consider because I think Mena could be an instant upgrade over some of the other options that the D-backs are throwing out there. I definitely don't want to get used to a bullpen opener much rather go with a guy like Mena or Blake Walston than continue throwing out Joe Mansply in the first inning. Uh, some other notes from game number one. Kevin Newman continues to carry the D-backs offense, which is not something I would have ever thought I said. Keta Marte, he's still good. He extended his hitting streak. Jock Peterson, of course, has also been phenomenal all year. But Kevin Newman, three for four in tonight's game. His slash line now is 276. 311 and 439. And if you look at Kevin Newman's stats entering game one against the LA Dodgers in the month of May, Kevin Newman has been absolutely on fire this month. 372 average, which is 16 for 43, with a 948 OPS in the month of May, which is 15 games. Absolutely phenomenal this month. Kevin Newman, again, carrying the D-backs offense in the eighth inning. We did see Lords Gurriel and Jake the Rick McCarthy go back-to-back to to make it interesting and cut the lead to two. For Gurriel, first home run since April 16th for Pina Power. 
And of course, D backs desperately need his bat to wake up. And for Jake McCarthy, his bat has been awake all season. Jake McCarthy has been a bright spot for the D backs this year. He was two for four in this game. His slash line now is 283, 357, 414. My crazy theory is if there's, especially if there's a righty on the mound, Jake McCarthy should either be leading off. If you think Carroll should be the leadoff hitter with a righty on the mound, I would switch Jake McCarthy with Carroll because Carroll, again, one for five. We like the one hit, but three strikeouts. Jake McCarthy is just a better player than Cormac Carroll right now, which is crazy to say, but it's true. So I would move Jake McCarthy to the leadoff spot, or I would not even be afraid to make Jake McCarthy the number two hitter because Keto Marte, when you look at the numbers, has been extremely better as the leadoff hitter than the number two hitter for the D-back. So uh, if you want to move Jake McCarthy up in the lineup, I'm either moving him and switching him with Corbin Carroll as the leadoff hitter or moving him to number two in the lineup because Keto Marte plays better when he's the leadoff hitter. But either way, I'm moving Jake McCarthy up. And then if there is a righty on the mound, why not move Corbin Carroll like down to the number five spot? Now you can have Jake, Ketel Marte and Corbin Carroll as and Jock Peterson as four of your top five hitters in your lineup. Like if there's a righty on the mound, why not go Ketel Marte, Jake McCarthy, Jock Peterson, Christian Walker, and then a Corbin Carroll, and then a Lord Gurriel. Now four of your top five hitters are lefties. And then if there's a righty on the mound, just make Lord Gurriel your number five hitter. Or make Lord Goriel your number three hitter. And then you can make like a Jock Peterson your number five hitter. And then a Corbin Carroll your number six hitter. I just think you have to get kind of crazy and kind of zany with the lineup. And maybe you just play the hot hand of Corbin Carroll, Lord Goriel, Eugenio Suarez. Like in terms of where their positioning in, where their positioning is in the lineup, you might just have to go with a hot hand approach because of all of them have been in such prolonged slumps. I don't think you could even go with the, oh, Corbin Carroll is a better player than that guy or Lord Gurriel is a righty, so you got to move him up higher in the lineup when there's a lefty on the mound. Like, all of them have been so bad recently. I think you just got to go and stack the lineup with just who's playing the best right now. So, game number one, D-backs lose. I don't think it's as bad as the game of the scoreboard says because it was really just one awful inning for the D-backs. That third inning where they gave up three home runs in one inning. D-backs still need their offense to do better, as we say a lot on this podcast. Need their starting pitching to do better as well. Obviously, with Slade Ciccone, but I'm still counting, that, still counting him as the starter for this game. And we'll see what game two has to offer, and hopefully the D-backs can bounce back where Brandon fought. On the mound. Let me tell you guys about LinkedIn Sales Navigator because are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever. And that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Snails Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. I am struggling. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. If you guys are watching me on YouTube, you can see me struggle with my video overlays. But let's get back to the podcast. And I want to do a little deep dive on this Ketel Marte season and talk about what's been going on recently because after Monday's game, 
Keto Marte extended his hit streak. It is now at 19 games. One of the craziest things about his hitting streak, his batting average has gone down during this hit streak. He's at 291. It was at like 310 or something before this hit streak started. One of the other reasons why I think Keto Marte should move back into the leadoff spot because he was a way better hitter by the numbers when he batted leadoff versus batting second in the lineup. Don't know why Tori Lavello made that switch. Uh, but it's a switch that I would like Tori Lavello to make back. So when you look at Keto Marte this season, Marte is having himself obviously a fantastic year. We just mentioned the 18-game hitting streak. And honestly, Marte is kind of back to being in the conversation for one of the best, if not the best, second baseman in baseball, not named Mookie Betts because Mookie Betts playing second base is a cheat code, and he is the best second baseman if he is going to play second base. But Marte is a currently stands, 291 average, 341 OBP with a 519 slugging, and he has nine home runs on the season, which leads the team. He has been hitting the ball at a monster rate in terms of the power that the ball is leaving his bat. When you look at Marte this season, the biggest numbers that jump off his page is the hard contact stats. Ketel Marte is absolutely crushing the ball this season. Career highs in exit velocity, barrel percentage, and hard hit, and hard hit percentage. The ball is flying off Ketel Marte's bat right now. and That is the sign when Ketel Marte is the most locked in. We look at his career. 2019, 2021, even last year, 2023, the 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 best years of Ketel Marte's career because for some reason he has always been good in the odd years. This is the first time it's been an even year in like the last six years that he's been good. But you look at all those years, the best years of Ketel Marte's career, the hard contact is always there. He's always a guy where maybe he's not hitting 40 home runs, but he's hitting a lot of doubles and he's hitting doubles that are line drives, missiles off the bat. And for Marte, that's what he's been able to do all season long. Rockets off the bat, straight up the middle, in the gaps. Marte is spraying it all over every field. And the hard contacts, or the hard contact stats are telling you, this is the most powerful season that we've ever seen from Ketel Marte. He is crushing the fastball. He is crushing the breaking ball. And like I said, when you look at those odd seasons, that's when he's at his absolute best, when he's crushing the fastball and the breaking ball. Right now, in Major League Baseball, Keto Marte is top five in both war among second basemen and WRC+. The only two second basemen that could say that is Jordan Westberg and Mookie Betts. So he's in pretty good company. I mean, for Jordan Westberg, Westberg, really good company for him. I mean, Kenta Marte has been in this footing before for the Orioles. I mean, they just keep producing insane level talents. And for Kenta Marte, one of the interesting things from his season this year, Marte is a guy that you look at his career numbers has always been bad, has always been better from the right side than the left side. But this year, that has not been the case. It's been the opposite. Marte is like a hundred points better from the left side with way more slugging. He's been a way better lefty hitter this season for the D-backs than he's been in the years past. And for Marte, his ability to hit from both sides of the plate makes him so dangerous because now you got a guy who historically has hit better from the right side, but this season he's hitting better from the left side. So if you're an opposing pitcher, it's like his career tells me one thing, but his sample size from this season tells me another. Now you don't know how to attack a Keta Marte. And it's one of the reasons he's having himself such a fantastic season offensively. And it's not just the offense. Keta Marte, when you go on fan graphs and you filter up and down every defensive metric for a second baseman, Keta Marte is second in basically every defensive stat for a second baseman. So, Offensively, he's doing it all. He's having his one one of his best offensive seasons ever. And defensively, he's making a case for the gold glove. Now, Marte, what does he need to work on to really round out his game? One, this season, he's striking out more than he's ever had. And he's also walking less, 
would like to see those two numbers start to flip. This season, he's also not been good with the runners in scoring position. And that's kind of the sneaky thing about Keta Marte. Uh, a couple years ago, he was really good in that situation. But last year, he was like fine, 275 average, 818 OPS. But in the past, he was like a superstar in that situation. In like 2021, 2019, Keta Marte crushed with runners in scoring position. But this year, not the case. In 2021, Keta Marte, 347 average, 1081 OPS with runners in scoring position. But this season in 2024, for as good as Marte has been, he has not come through in the clutch. 220 average, 643 OPS with runners in scoring position. We also know he's not good when the game is late and close. Again, what does that mean? Seventh inning or later, and the game was, and the game is, uh, the game is within one run. Keta Marte, also statistically not good in those situations. So, what do I need to work on from Keta Marte? Get more clutch, be better as the game gets later, and strike out less and walk a little bit more for me. Keta Marte making about fifty million annually over the next three to four years on one of the best contracts in Major League Baseball. Keta Marte is back in the conversation for best second baseman in baseball. And right now on his, what, 19-game hitting streak, he is one of the pillars in this D-backs lineup and one of the only, and one of the only silver linings in this D-backs offense as they continue to struggle. But Keta Marte continues to put on a show and maybe he himself can carry the D-backs offensively to a series win against the L.A. Dodgers. Now, if you want to place some bets and win some money on the number one fantasy sports app, then, of course, you have to go to Prize Picks because Prize Picks is America's Number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Right now, what my favorite thing to do on prize picks is to do some basketball entries because whenever the Nuggets and the Timberwolves were playing, I was taking the over on the Jokic points and the over on the Anthony Edwards points. And when all that was hitting and I saw a bank account, I saw money hit my bank account. It brought a tremendous smile to my face. If you want to see a tremendous smile on your face, then just download the app today and use code lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app today. Use code locked on MLB all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. Let's talk about game two Brandon Fott versus Gavin Stone. D backs are searching for a bounce back victory in game number two with their rising, emerging. Ace on the mound, Brandon Fott, who is starting to come into his own. He's been pitching really well recently, and the D-backs are going to need Brandon Fott to continue his recent run. Not only are they going to need him to continue his recent run, it would be nice if he could combine the way he's been pitching recently with how he pitched against the Dodgers last year in the postseason. If we can get that combination the D-backs might actually have a chance to win tomorrow. To do that, you're probably going to need, what, six innings of one earned run baseball with like eight strikeouts from Brandon Fott. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? I don't know. Otani, Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith, Teoscar, those guys are dangerous, but it feels like all season long, it's been the Miguel Rojas, the Kike Hernandez, the the Andes Pajas, like, I don't even know how to pronounce half their names. It feels like it's been all the margin guys, the secondary guys that have killed the D-backs this season. And for Brandon Fott, yeah, it's a juggernaut lineup, and I really don't know what to do if you're Brandon Fott to take down that lineup. The best thing I could suggest, is just do whatever you did from your last start if you're Fott because he was 
absolutely nasty in his most recent start against the Cincinnati Reds. Seven innings, one earned run, nine strikeouts, and only two hits. Again, it's the Cincinnati Reds, but Brandon Fott still looked phenomenal. 40% whiff rate with six strikeouts on his sweeper alone in his last start. His combination of that fastball sweeper has been his go-to two-pitch combo, and it's been pretty unhittable this season. It's been able to generate a lot of whiffs, a lot of strikeouts, and he's been able to really limit damage against those two pitches this season. And so going against the LA Dodgers, we're going to need a, a, a bunned up Brandon Fott. We're going to need six, seven strong, potentially shutout innings from Brandon Fott with a whole lot of strikeouts because the strikeouts would hopefully demoralize the players in that Dodgers lineup. I feel like whenever the D-backs win, you do see multiple strikeouts from either an Otani, a Mookie, a Freddie Freeman. Usually it's not those guys going 0 for 4, 0 for 5 with no strikeouts. Usually they get a couple on the board the days the D-backs do win the ball games against the Dodgers. And Brenda Fott is someone that can rack up the Ks. So want to see if you can do that tomorrow against the Dodgers. Last season against the Dodgers, nine earned runs in 8.2 innings pitch with two home runs, but did get nine strikeouts. This entire Dodgers lineup against Brandon Fott in their career, if you took the cumulative of everyone on this lineup that have, that has gone against Brandon Fott, the entire lineup is 16 for 40 against Fott in their career. So very good success against Brandon Fott when you're looking up and down this Dodgers lineup. But Fott is someone who I think is much improved from last season. I don't think this is last year's Fott. I think this is a guy who has taken... Everything that he learned last year, all the mistakes, he started to correct them, and he's really starting to blossom and emerge as one of the best pitchers on this D-back staff, and hopefully he can have himself another coming out party against the Dodgers in game number two. But for the D-backs, they're going to see Gavin Stone of the Dodgers for the first time in his career. He's a righty who throws primarily change-up sinker fastball. He has like a couple more pitches, but those are his main three, and his changeup has been absolutely unhittable this year when you're looking at the numbers, and he's just a way better pitcher than he was last year. When you look at the development of Gavin Stone, much improved from last season, and that's kind of one of the things when you look at the Dodgers versus D-backs. Yes, the Dodgers, big market, can spend all the money in the world, but they just also do a damn good job of just developing their guys and their talent. Guys like Landon Knack and Gavin Stone, when your Walker Buehlers and your Clayton Kershaws are not there in your rotation, you, even your Bobby Millers, other young guys, when they're not there in your rotation, you got guys from your minor league coming up, getting called up, and stepping up to the plate and just looking fantastic right away. Stone, Knack are pretty elite depth pieces, and now they're trade assets when the rest of your rotation gets healthy. Meanwhile, if you're a D-backs fan, you're pulling your hair out every time you see a Ryan Nelson on the mound, or Slade, or Bryce Jarvis, or Tommy Henry, or Dre Jameson, or Corbin Martin, or J.B. Braskakis, or Alex Young, or Taylor Clark. Like, the list goes on and on of guys the D-backs have tried to make work, tried to make fetch that they've thrown out there, tried to develop and be a rotation member, be a reliever, but... The D-backs are just not winning on the margins like a team like the LA Dodgers are. You can't blame market size on that. Yes, the Dodgers can spend more money than, than the government, it seems like. Yes, they go out there and can trade for any star, but you can't help but deny they develop a ton of pitchers from their minor leagues. They develop guys like Will Smith in their lineup. Dodgers are just an elite organization. And for the D-backs, the margins are one of the errors they have struggled this year. It's a big reason why it doesn't look like the D-backs are, are in the contention for a World Series right now. But again, you never know. Last year, D-backs elite in the first half, bad in the second half. So I'm hoping this year it's different. We feel bad all year about how the D-backs played in the first half of the season. And then all of a sudden, 
In the second half, post-All-Star break, they catch fire and ride it all the way to the postseason. Now that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight as we'll talk after Game 2, after the D-backs take down the LA Dodgers. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Doses.